Hello, everybody, and I'm going to start by proceedings by welcoming you to the RDS Library. And we're here this afternoon in partnership with the Dublin Book Festival. Um, we have an afternoon of some good chat, I, had, I think, ahead of us with two events and two eminent broadcasters to host these talks. And the first being uh, Miriam O'Callaghan in conversation with Stephen Walker regarding his new book, John Hume, The Persuader. And the second one is with Donald Fallon in conversation with Eileen Cullity, Dermot Maledi, and Jade Wilson, looking at the media influence on public opinion, uh, with the talk taking the title from Dermot's new book, Shifting Sentiment. Just briefly introduce myself. My name is Deirdre Nocton, and I am chair of the Library and Archive Committee. And the mission of the committee here is to work with the library staff, headed by Natasha Stern, uh, to ensure, I suppose, the preservation and the promotion of the RDS collections for their continued use and into the future and for the use of future generations. And we do this through public exhibitions and talks such as this one and through our comprehensive digital project, uh, which opens access to both the archives and to the art collections here at the RDS. So if anyone is interested, you can Google us at the RDS Digital Archive. Just have a um, little bit of housekeeping to do first, and that is to point you in the direction of the fire escape, which is just behind us here. And to say for anyone who is staying for the second talk, there is tea and coffee available in the interval. So without further ado, I'm happy to introduce you to the first event of the afternoon. And that, of course, is author and award-winning journalist Stephen Walker in discussion with Miriam O'Callaghan about his book, John Hume, The Persuader. Um, the book um, is a very comprehensive um, series of over 100 interviews um, with many of Hume's colleagues, his critics, and his family members. And it looks at who was or who was the real John Hume and how did this most significant of public figures persuade presidents and prime ministers and the people to take the risks and back his vision of Northern Ireland and peace. So thank you very much and enjoy. Thanks, Mayan, for that, Deirdre. I love being in this room. It's a beautiful library. It's a beautiful place, a fitting place for me to interview one of my favorite men, Stephen Walker. Um, I loved John Hume, sounds biased, but I do think he was very important. Why did you decide to write a book on John Hume? Well, I mean, obviously, as a, as a journalist in Northern Ireland, I had, I had watched his career, and like you, I'd interviewed him many times. Mm. Um, so I was well aware of what I thought was John Hume, what his characteristics were, what his life was, what his story was. But it was only when he died in 2020 that I began to realize that there were large swathes of his life that I was unfamiliar with. I, I knew about him um, going to Maynooth and possibly becoming a priest. Mm. I knew a little bit about his credit union work. I knew about his civil rights work. Um, but I started to look at it. And then I realized that um, when I was involved in the reporting of, of his death, that the last traditional biography was 1997, mm. which was actually a year before the Good Friday Agreement. So I thought there was a gap there in the telling of John Hume's story. I, I then started to interview some people with the possibility of, of doing a book. And then I contacted uh, Gill Publishers and they informed me very interestingly that they had tried to do a memoir with John Hume back in 2002 and 2003. And they had conducted a series of interviews with Hume and they were able to offer me 25 unpublished uh, transcripts uh, of Hume and then so from that point onwards I realized well actually we've got some new material here uh, and it would make a book. Yeah and a great book it is. Listen when we start off with you reading an excerpt I loved the beginning Mark Durkin and, and when he was at almost a cliff face a precipice tell us about that and read a little maybe if you don't mind. Okay so this is 1992 this is obviously before the ceasefires. It's six years before the Good Friday Agreement. There's been a whole round of talks taking place. Um, not an awful lot of progress. There's still 
daily shootings and bombings going on in Northern Ireland. It's a pretty grim time. John Hume is under enormous pressure. He's under enormous pressure um, from uh, colleagues who just aren't sure about his leadership. Um, there's been criticism of in the newspapers. Obviously, he's an MP and an MEP, so he feels a lot of pressure. He reaches a point in 1992 where he decides to resign. And this story that I'm, I'm, that I'm about to tell you has never been told before. This was told to me by Mark Durkin during the interviews. And um, so it has, uh, has remained a secret for, for those number of decades. Basically, Hume had written out a resignation statement that he was minutes away from giving to the Press Association. He was going to stand down as party leader. He was going to stand down as MP. He was going to leave politics. And he wanted Durkin to take over his seat and I suppose possibly ultimately would have taken over the party leadership. Mm. Pat Hume is desperate to stop this happening. Pat Hume, and you knew Pat very well, um, she was often the voice of calm. She was often uh, where John sometimes was a bit gruff. She was very graceful and kind and measured. So she rings Mark Durkin on this Saturday morning to basically tell him to come to the house. Uh, he's only a few minutes away. Durkin knew by the tone of her voice that all was not well. So I'll just read you a little bit. <clears throat> when Durkin arrived at the Hume's home minutes later, it was clear all was not well. Pat ushered him in and John unburdened himself. He had simply had enough of being SDLP leader. He was battered by the constant criticism and he was convinced some of his colleagues would not support him in another round of inter-party talks. He felt undermined. He was cross with the press coverage and he believed resignation was the only way out. He told Durkin that his 13-year reign as leader was over. Durkin listened and then responded by using John Hume tactics on John Hume. He reminded him that he always said, you don't react to reaction. Durkin argued that he should pause and think. He urged his friend to simply work through the consequences. It was role reversal. The apprentice was advising the master. Hume, so often the dispenser of logic and wisdom to colleagues, was now being urged to heed his own advice. With every response from Durkin, there came another dramatic Hume revelation of what he believed had to happen. Hume informed his assistant that as well as quitting the party leadership, he also wanted to give up his Westminster seat. He candidly told Durkin that he needed to be ready to fill his shoes and become the new foil MP. Durkin countered this argument by telling Hume that this was not the time to step away from Parliament. Hume had been having secret conversations with the Sinn Féin president, Gerry Adams, with the hope that the talks could lead to a permanent IRA ceasefire. Durkin made it clear to Hume that if he quit Parliament and walked away from leadership, this will wreck everything. It was a powerful argument for peace. Hume then offered Durkin a document to read. It was a two-page statement about to be issued to the Press Association announcing his departure as SDLP leader. For Durkin, it was a devastating read. The press release was incendiary and Hume's guest knew it must not be issued under any circumstances. The two men then talked some more and the atmosphere improved. Finally, it was agreed that John and Pat would think about things over the weekend and would not say anything publicly. They agreed to go to their holiday home in Donegal, relax and unwind, and take time to get their breath. Durkin had achieved what Pat Hume hoped he would. He had talked her husband back from the brink. As he headed for the door, he still had the document detailing Hume's intention to quit. Outside the house, he said his goodbyes, and Pat Hume mouthed a thank you to him and held up crossed fingers. She was relieved that the crisis had been averted. Before his guest could drive off, John Hume raised his arm and told him to stop. He then asked for the return of his resignation statement. <laughs> Durkin's sleight of hand had not been clever enough. The Humes headed for Donegal. Mark Durkin went in the opposite direction and drove to Belfast. 
he had already done a day's work, a good day's work, convincing his friend and mentor to stay the course and finish the job. Sometimes persuaders need to be persuaded too. It's a great part. Just so imagine though, if he hadn't persuaded him back from the brink, you know, the what if version of history. I mean, I wonder what Mark, did you would think about if he had failed that day to get him to come back from the brink? Yeah, I mean, oh, he would have gone obviously in 92. Mm -hmm. Uh, so Durkin would have stood uh, mm -hmm. in foil for 92 and probably if Durkin would have been elected, we possibly wouldn't have had the 1994 ceasefire. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't have had Hugh Adams. We wouldn't have had those behind the scenes negotiations. We possibly wouldn't have had the 1998 Good Friday Agreement. And at the end of the book, um, in the concluding chapter where I sum up Hume's legacy and Hume's contribution, mm. there's a quote from Dick Spring. And Dick Spring says, without John Hume, and I'm paraphrasing, but without John Hume, the troubles would still be going on in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. And that is a frightening thought, a frightening mm -hmm. thought. I mean, Spring says, you know, Hume's achievement was to bring peace, was to change the atmosphere, and was to get a political agreement. Do you feel you got to know John Hume more when you were writing the book, Stephen? And what drove him? I mean, people talk about his childhood forming him. Not everyone knows about his upbringing. What do you think formed him and gave him the qualities that enabled him, I suppose, to change the course of Irish history? Well, I think, um, I think we're, we're all shaped by our upbringing. We're all shaped by our childhood and our parents and our friends and our schools. And, and Hume is exactly the same. John Hume is a product of Derry. Um, one of his teachers at Maynooth said that John Hume spoke like a dairy man, thought like a dairy man, lived like a dairy man. So dairy was very much part of his DNA. It was part of his political outlook. He saw dairy as a divided place, but as a place where people could make agreements. And he wanted to extrapolate that for Northern Ireland. He was heavily influenced by his parents. Um, there wasn't a lot of money around in that household. So very early on, he could see what money could do. He was never motivated by money, but he could see the importance of money. So his mum brought in extra work at night, and he helped his mum with uh, garments and shirts. He did a paper round as a young boy, and all the money went into the, the family kitty. So that, that influenced him. And again, when he set up the credit union, again, it's money. And his dad influenced him with a sense of community because his dad had great bouts of unemployment, but his dad had worked in the civil service, so his dad knew how government departments worked. Mm -hmm. So when neighbors came looking for help, whether it was benefits or housing and wanted to write letters, they used Sam Hume, and Sam Hume had this wonderful handwriting, copper handwriting, and he was able to write beautiful letters. They looked nice, but also, because he was a civil servant, he knew what to say. And John remembers people coming into the house seeking help. So I think those are two building blocks, the building block of money and the building block of, of, of community service. And I think those are two things that influenced him. And then his faith. He had a very strong faith. I think he had a great sense of fair play, a great sense of fairness, and a great sense of justice. And they also say, obviously from the faith, perspective when he went to become a priest in Maynooth. Now, he didn't become a priest, as we know, but the whole thing about logic and stickability, those kind of traits I read about in your book too really stuck to John when he was later in life a politician. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I think one of Hume's great characteristics is his ability to see what the next step is and what the next step and the next step. So you know, politicians in Northern Ireland who were simply thinking about tomorrow, well, Hume was able to think about next week and the week after. And he was able to apply that training and that love of logic that he got at Maynooth in a political sense. So when he would go into negotiations, you know, he could strip down the Northern Ireland problem to strand one, strand two, strand three. These are the th three sets of relationships we need to look at. That's Hume speak. 
That's Hume. The Good Friday Agreement, Eamon McCann, who obviously had his political differences with Hume, basically says the Good Friday Agreement is Hume speak writ large. Mm. And it is, because if you think of what Hume was doing in the 1960s, he wrote an article, two articles for the Irish Times in the 1960s where he talked about consent. And it was very odd for people from a nationalist background or a nationalist tradition to talk about consent. So he was one of the first people to publicly talk about consent when it came to the status of Northern Ireland. And he had no problem using the phrase Northern Ireland. Um, mm. uh, he talked about the reform of the police service in the 1970s, way before the RUC became the PSNI. He talked about North-South relations way before other people were arguing about it. So he did have that sense to be able to look at a problem, distill it, and, and work out what the step should be. And you mentioned at the beginning about obviously being at the brink once. Did you notice though, and I found it very powerful in your book, Stephen, that when he came up against those very difficult times, like he was talking to Jerry Adams, he had obviously great criticism publicly, North and South and everywhere, for him bothering to talk to the men and women of violence. I mean, it's easy now to wonder why that was so difficult, but that was incredibly courageous and incredibly difficult for him, wasn't it? Well, it was, and I, I think courage is one of his characteristics, mm -hmm. and, and not just the courage that you're referring to there of, of actually carrying on, because, he, he, and particularly when it came to talking, I mean, he said, you know, Politics is an alternative to war. So if we have violence, then the only alternative is to talking. And even when he was getting grief from the press and from other politicians about talking to the IRA, he would still try and encourage unionists to have similar conversations with loyalists because he felt that was the only way to go forward. But his courage just didn't appear then in the 1980s and 90s. I think if you track his life, you can see his courage on the streets of Derry, where he physically went out and tried to hold young men back on the streets and tried to make sure that they didn't get into trouble. You saw his courage at McGilligan when, when he, he, he took on a British Army officer and, and argued about the way that the British Army were behaving. That was courageous. So yes, I think that was part of... Mark Durkin said you know, that his greatest trait was this word. I'm not even sure stickability is a word in the English language, <laughs> but Mark Durkin uses it. But uh, it, it is, well, we know what it means, but I mean, his ability to keep going and keep going and keep going. And they were difficult times. And, and you'll remember the coverage, mm. uh, particularly from the independent group, the Sunday Independent, um, who did not think that Hume was doing the right thing. Um, but he, uh, and, I, and that hurt the family. Uh, that really hurt the family. And Pat tried to encourage John not to read the newspapers. They, they tried to keep the Sunday newspapers away from him, but he wanted to read it. And that particularly hurt him because he couldn't understand why people didn't realize what he was trying to do. Um, and that's another really powerful thing I discovered from your book I didn't know before about the impact on his children and the attempt to kidnap one of his daughters. I mean, remind people of that story. I actually didn't know that story until I read your book. Well, Hume faced criticism um, from um, the IRA, uh, and he faced criticism from um, loyalist paramilitaries, and both the IRA and loyalist paramilitaries um, wanted to attack, maim, kill, hurt the Hume family. Mm -hmm. The Hume car was burnt, the Hume office was attacked, the home was attacked when the children were in. Uh, near the family home, there was graffiti about Hume being a traitor. And in the 1970s, um, the IRA uh, tried to kidnap one of his daughters, Anya. They knew what school she went to. They had obviously done their research. They arrive at the school um, and they snatch a girl and put her in a car and drive away. Now, the girl they snatched was not Anya. It was a girl that looked like Anya. Um, and it was only when the abductors went through this young girl's school bag that they realized they had actually taken the wrong girl. So uh, that's what the human family faced. And their home um, was always open. The door was always open for people to come in and seek help. 
They didn't hide away. John Hume refused to have a firearm. He didn't want personal protection. He said, you know, I'm a man of peace. It would be, I would be a hypocrite if I carried a weapon. Um, so he was right in the heart of the community, which again was a very brave thing to do. Um, so they were, they were difficult times. And Mo Hume talks about it in the book. And she said, you know, there were times when it wasn't very cool to be John Hume's daughter. And I think that's fairly clear. I suppose critics would say one thing he did was that he sacrificed everything, maybe his own health even in the end, but he certainly sacrificed his party, people would say, in the pursuit of the bigger picture piece on this island. Did you find that when you were writing your book that people made that point or not? Or was it ever going to be possible to save and keep the SDLP as big as it was? Well, <laughs> there's a complex answer to this, and there's an easy, it is complicated, and it's yeah. complicated because I, 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 I think you can't just simply say in simplistic terms, you know, um, sort of the SDLP went down and Sinn Féin sort of went up. Well, Sinn Féin went up for a reason. So there were a whole series of things that kind of came together. The SDLP did not plan for life post Hume. Mm. Uh, the SDLP um, were not as active on the ground ultimately as Sinn Féin were. They weren't as well organized. And there was a whole new generation coming up that were attracted to Sinn Féin in a way they weren't attracted to the SDLP. So there was that happening. Mm. Um, I think there was a degree of naivety from John Hume. He was warned by party colleagues, and I talk about it in the book. They said, if you bring Jerry Adams into the tent, so to speak, um, then Sinn Féin will leapfrog us, and, and we, will, we will lose electorally. And John Hume argued at party meetings. He said, no, 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 the, the people will always remember that we were the party that argued for Sinn Féin to come in. The people will always remember that we did the heavy lifting. Well. Some people remembered, but ultimately the electorate went the other way. Um, so there is that. Um, and I, I think, you know, a lot of people feel, even unionists to this day still argue that whilst the peace is a great thing and Northern Ireland is in a better place, they feel, some of them to this day still argue that the IRA were on their knees, in their words, back in the 80s and the 90s, and that Hume basically gave them a get out of jail card too quickly. And they still argue that. Um, so, you know, just as Hume was a controversial figure when he was alive, he's mm. a controversial figure in death as well. Very interesting. What do you think? I think that um, he took a decision that if he could save a single life, it was worth it. And he did privately warn party members that he would walk away. I think he was convinced very early on that without talking, that without Sinn Féin in the mix, Northern Ireland was never going to be at peace. I do think he was naive. I do think he underestimated um, the strength of Sinn Féin. I do think he underestimated the electorate. I think he thought the electorate would give him a bigger boost and his party a bigger boost um, than uh, actually arrived. And I do think um, he didn't pay enough attention to the internal workings of his party. Mm -hmm. And there is criticism that, 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 that people feel he, he didn't pay enough attention to party organization. He didn't pay enough attention to party administration. Others argue, well, that wasn't his job. He's a CEO. He's not meant to know exactly how everything works. But modern day politics, if you are a leader, you have to be a good media performer, you have to be a good party organizer, you have to be often a statesman. So there's all kinds of different roles. And I think John had no problem being a political leader. He had no problem being a statesman. He had no problem being a negotiator, but he wasn't really interested in the intricacies of party organization. That wasn't for him. I wonder though, will history look back and decide, I'm interesting to see, would you think, having written the book, Stephen, that maybe the bigger prize of peace in itself is how he will be remembered rather than for maybe not doing the best by his party or not being obsessed with the detail? What do you think? I think that's absolutely true. I think that is absolutely true. He had a goal, and the goal was um, to 
end the violence and to get a political accommodation. And he ended the violence and there was a political accommodation. Imperfect as it is, mm. we don't have a government. We haven't had a government for many, many months in Northern Ireland. And there is a whole list of things that need to be done. Um, and Stormont, as you know, because you've reported on it for many years, um, <laughs> is imperfect. Mm. The, the, the coalition government is imperfect. Um, and the petition of concern is abused. And there are procedures and, and things in place there that, that need to be looked at. Um, but he believed that without talking, there would be nothing. And I think he would probably want to be remembered more as the man that delivered the peace rather than the man that delivered four or five SDLP MPs. Because he always spoke as well. You interviewed him loads. I interviewed, and he always had a mantra, you know, this was the best opportunity for peace in a generation. We're a divided people, not a divided land. I often look at the Middle East right now and wonder, Perhaps they need someone like a John Hume who talks like that because whatever we say, there's no government up and running. But it is different when you go north now or go to Northern Ireland, however we call it. Like, it's completely different. I used to go up a lot with my husband and people were being killed all the time. That doesn't happen anymore. Well, I mean, you're absolutely right. The, the, the Northern Ireland of 1973 is light years away from the Northern Ireland of 2023. Um, I mean, um, when I tell my kids about going into Marks and Spencers in Belfast and having to go through security gates or being frisked or somebody standing there with a little metal detector, or I mean, yeah. Steve, uh, your husband will remember the, the city buses in Belfast and there would be a man or a woman that would go up the city bus and would look under your seats <laughs> to see to see if, you, if there was a bomb under the seats. And you know, you tell anybody in Northern Ireland that under 30, what? And nobody knows what a control zone was. A control zone was where you couldn't park your car in a control zone because the, the security forces were worried that it would be a car bomb. Now, you know, in the 70s, if you were in a pub and you looked outside and you saw a, a, a car parked outside, you'd think, you know, is that a car bomb? Whereas today, if you look outside, you say, that's a parked car. So, you know, the whole thing has changed. Belfast is a changed city. Northern Ireland is a changed city. There are still enormous problems. There is still issues over identity. There are still issues over reconciliation. There is still the fundamental issue over power sharing. All that, I take that as read. But in terms of people's outlook, um, it is a million miles away from the world that John Hume was inhabiting back in 1973. You put so much effort into all the interviews you did for this book, Steve, and that's why it's so fascinating. But did you like Hugh Moore at the end of your research <laughs> or not? Well, I think I learned loads more about him. And I think I have a much better understanding of him. And whereas as a journalist, you're just, he, as a journalist, he would frustrate the hell out of us because <laughs> he just said the same thing over and over and over again. And often you would, if, sometimes if you had a choice between interviewing him <laughs> or Malin, you might go for Malin because yeah. Malin would give you something. And whereas Hume would give you the same speech he gave you, you know. <laughs> Yesterday. Yes. And the joke was that it was known as the single transferable speech because right. he'd talk about you can't eat a flag, agreement threatens no one. And all, we've, we kind of heard that all before. And I've now done a number of these events, so I now think I'm capable of doing a joint <laughs> single transferable speech. My poor wife has listened to this for about six times now, so she'd probably confer that as well. Um, but it worked. It worked. Single transferable speech worked because the Good Friday Agreement delivered because there was a ceasefire. And so, you know, he talked about agreement threatening no one. He talked about you can't eat a flag. And he said it over and over again. So... We find them frustrating. Unionists, and, and there, is, there is criticism of, of Hume in the book. It's not a, it's not a, um, a hagiography. It's not all about mm. the great things that John Hume did. There is criticism of, of Hume, and, and unionists talk about it in the book that, that they, some of them, prefer to deal with Malin mm. because they found Malin more straightforward. Uh, David Trimble is, is quoted in the book as saying, uh, dealing with John Hume is a bit like grappling with fog. <laughs> you're, you're not really sure what he said or what he's... 
what, it, what has been agreed, whereas they would go into a room and they would say to Malin, right, these are the five things, one, two, three, four, five, and Malin would say, well, I can do business on one, two, and three, but I can't do business on four at the moment, and I definitely can't do business on five. Well, at least there was an understanding mm -hmm. where you stood. Um, so he was, uh, Hume was very complex, um, he was very logical, he had that stickability, um, and I suppose without his stickability, mm. we wouldn't be where we are today. I mean, Northern Ireland is living in John Hume's world. There's no doubt about that. That atmosphere and that environment is because of the work of John Hume. So oh, interesting. How important do you think his wife, Pat, was to him being able to do what he did? Well, she is an absolute essential part of the story, and, and she's in the book. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, um, Phil Coulter says, uh, Phil Coulter, the, the, yeah. the, the musician, says, um, you know, without, without Pat Hume, there would be no John Hume. And even John Hume, you know, John Hume regularly acknowledged that. You know, he described himself as, as, as a parcel, and Pat delivered him. Pat <laughs> told him where he had to be, where he, what time he had to be there, who was picking him up, what speech he had to deliver. And so she was a community organizer. Mm. She was his confidant. She was often, when there was a decision to be made, she was often the first person he spoke about it to and the last person. So Pat Hume was John Hume's first and last. And she was, she had a great political antennae mm. um, and she understood things very quickly and she had a great sense of community service. And she would always encourage those that worked in the office that we are here to serve. Mm. And you have really testing situations. For example, the Hume house would be attacked. So it would be attacked with petrol bombs and bricks and stones or whatever. And Pat would look out and she would recognize some of the people in the street throwing stones at her house because they were local youths. Mm. The police would arrive, they would detain those youths, Pat would then go about her business for the evening, the next morning Pat would go into John's office as his office organizer, and the mothers of those boys who had been outside her house the next day, the, the previous night, would come into the office seeking Pat's help to find out what police station their children were in the very children that had been attacking her house the night before. And she didn't blink an eye. She said, okay, I will, I will help you. And, and so her mantra was, I don't care what your politics are. I don't care what side of the divide you come from. We are here as public representatives to serve. And she was incredibly popular. And I remember having a conversation with somebody in Derry and we were talking about John Hume's electoral record, which is very impressive. Mm. And, um, um, he, the person said to me, there is one person you know that would have beaten John Hume in an election in Derry. And I said, really? He said, oh, yes. I said, who's that? He says, Pat Hume. Yeah. Um, so she was a, a, a remarkable figure. And, and you'll recall from your time of dealing with Pat, when, when John maybe was silent and didn't say a lot mm. and was difficult to reach, Pat would be the opposite. Mm. Pat would be charming, graceful, very easy. to. And if there was an issue... Pat would smooth things over. And also, and you have it in the book again, Stephen, that famous moment now at one of the funerals in Grace Steel where he got very, very upset when a member of one of the families came up, obviously, and said at the coffin last night, we all said you're to keep going, John, keep going, and he broke down. And Pat will confirm, and you have it in the book, that he did have a breakdown after that. So there were moments in Hume's life where... It did all get too much. Oh, it did. And I mean, we began this yeah. conversation, you know, half an hour ago and I, I read the passage about Mark Durkin and that was another example of where it had got too much, where he wanted to resign. He felt he could do no more. He wanted to walk away. So there was that moment in 92. You're absolutely right. There was the moment in, of Grey Steel. There was the moment when Jerry Adams carried the coffin of the Shankill bomber. Mm. And again, he was under enormous pressure. People were saying, how can you talk to Jerry Adams when he has just carried the coffin of the Shankill bomber? Mm. 
Um, so enormous pressure. Um, the only thing I would say about John is, and there is no doubt in my mind that the pressure that he was under um, exacerbated his uh, illness. health, his yeah. illness, um, and uh, he had a series of strokes in, in, in Austria. Um, he was a hypochondriac. Yeah, he was, yeah. He was obsessed with his health. And um, uh, Reg Empey, the, the Ulster Unionist peer, said that if you were ever in John Hume's company, uh, the <laughs> worst thing you could ever say to John Hume was, how are you, John? <laughs> he said, because you'd be there about four and a half hours. <laughs> And there would be this long litany of, of and, and Tim Atwood from uh, the SDLP uh, said that if you were in John's company and you said to John, I've got a sore ear, John would say, I, I, I've got a sore ear too. <laughs> or I've got a sore leg, so have I. My back's playing up, so's mine. And so he did have yeah. this thing where he was, he was obsessed. And, and it, it did reach a point whereby, because he talked about it so much, a bit like the boy crying wolf, yeah. people kind of stopped listening to him. And maybe there was an occasion when people should have listened to him because in the run-up to his collapse in Austria, um, he clearly wasn't well, and there were signs at, at party meetings that he wasn't well, but then people just dismissed it as, oh, that's just John, that's just John. <laughs> and so, yes, I think the constant pressure of the media, I think the pressure of party colleagues, I think the pressure of, of the talks, maybe not going anywhere, certainly made life very difficult for him on a personal level. I'm going to throw to the floor now in a minute. Just one last thing, the role of Trimble. You mentioned David Trimble earlier, and you write about you know, the relationship between them and the book. They were key figures, both of them. You know, Sometimes I think David gets a little bit lost because John drove it so much, but how do you think their relationship was and how key, I mean, they both got obviously the Nobel laureate for peace, but how key do you think the dynamic of that duo was? I think they were a bit like the odd couple. <laughs> um, I, I, they were, they're, they're both complex men yeah. and they could be difficult men. Um, uh, I, I, I told a story last night, um, first time, um, I was introduced to Trimble. I was appointed London correspondent for BBC Northern Ireland, so I was in Millbank in Westminster, and I contacted one of his assistants, and I said, look, I've just been appointed London correspondent. I'm going to be bumping into David, you know, David a lot. We're going to have to have some kind of relationship. Could, could we meet? And he said, well, look, um, why don't you... He's doing an interview for the World Service at 10 o'clock on Tuesday morning in Millbank near your desk. Why don't you hang around the corridor, and he'll come out of the interview and we'll engineer a meeting and that'll and, that, and you, you can have a little chat and that'll start things. I said, that's a really good idea. So I get in there early, I go and find the studio, I look through the window, I can see Trimble talking, I hang around in the corridor, the door opens at 10 past 10, I'm at the end of the corridor, uh, uh, his assistant is a lovely guy called Barry White, Barry sees me, gives me the thumbs up, says, right, go on, go for it, go for it. I go towards David Trimble, I put my hand out and I say, Mr. Trimble, Stephen Walker, BBC Northern Ireland, and he says, hello, goodbye, <laughs> and walks off. And that was, and so he was completely and utterly unpredictable <laughs> and, uh, and difficult and complex. And um, so they had an odd, they, they had an odd relationship. Yeah. I think they respected each other. I think Trimble knew that Hume was a man of great intellect. Um, and interestingly, if you look at the speech that Trimble gave um, when they both were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, Hume gave a speech um, to party conference where he described unionists as a petty people. And as you can imagine, that didn't go down very well <laughs> in unionist circles. And there was uproar, the Belfast Telegraph, I had, I had it on the front page, and it was a political story for a while. And a lot of unionists never forgave Hume for saying that. And in fact, when Trimble got his Nobel Peace Prize, he says in his speech, we are not a petty people. And Hume is about 10 yards away. Uh, and he'd waited a long time, a long time to say that. So. There was, there was friction. Um, it's quite interesting 
um, when they appeared together at um, the famous Bono photograph in the Waterfront mm. Hall at the time of the referendum, where you have Bono in the middle and, and holding up uh, Trimble in uh, Hume's hand. Trimble was awkward in social occasions, um, but one of Trimble's assistants, David Kerr, said on that evening, mm. Hume relaxed Trimble. Hume spotted that Trimble is, is, this is not, Trimble is outside his comfort zone. Mm. Um, and Hume worked hard to make Trimble feel at ease because Hume realized this is a symbolic moment. We have to appear together. We have to appear united. And so they bounced off each other. Mm. But they were both complex and difficult men, not easy. Could be your next book. Oh, David Trimble. <laughs> we'll I'm going to throw to the floor. Would anyone like to ask? Yeah, the gentleman there with glasses. Do we have a mic or will we just? Yeah, we have a microphone here for you. Thanks so much. That was brilliant, Stephen. Well done. Thank you very much, Stephen. That was really, that was great. Um, I worked in the European Parliament for the whole time that John Hume was an MEP. And I saw how important it was for him to be affirmed by the groups in the European Parliament, particularly the socialist group. That seemed to be very important for him. He loved the famous Kale Bridge example of reconciliation between Fra France and Germany. And I guess it was also a time out for him from some of the, his negotiations in the North. But there's one element I didn't know at all, and that is to what extent did he have contacts with, with Paisley and Jim Nicholson when they were together out of sight, uh, to some extent, from Northern Ireland politics. Well, he had a good relationship with Paisley. Oh, whoa, gosh, there we are. <laughs> it was the word Paisley that did it. <laughs> <laughs> there you are, he's still an influence. <laughs> Go um, again. I'll tell you a funny story. My favorite story in the book involves Paisley. Yeah, it's great. Um, so, um, and I'm going to do a Paisley impression, which I hope you, uh, I hope you enjoy. Um, so, um, Hume has to go and visit Paisley. Paisley has a house in, uh, Paisley has a house in, in Cypress Avenue, obviously made famous by uh, Van Morrison. And um, so, uh, Hume is taken from Derry to uh, Belfast to meet Paisley, I, and I suspect it's some kind of European issue. And they worked together, as you, as you rightly said, particularly when there was money to come to Northern Ireland and uh, they would put, and with Jim Nicholson, they did a, a, a united front uh, and they did work together. There's no, doubt, there's no doubt about that. So Paisley wanted to see him, so off they trot. They go to the Paisley's house. Uh, he's driven by a guy called Don McRae, who was Hume's driver. They get into Paisley's house. They have a nice meeting. It's all very convivial. The meeting's over. Paisley Sr. standing on the back step. Hume and McRae get into their car. McRae puts the key in, and the car won't start. And Paisley Sr. says, what's the matter there, young Hume? And uh, he says, well, you know, the car won't start. So in the garage was Ian Paisley Jr. So Ian Sr. says, Ian, come over here and help this man out. So Ian Jr. brings the car around and parks his car beside Hume's car. And they get the jump leads from Ian Jr.'s car into Hume's car. And after about a minute, Hume's car springs to life. Ian Jr. pulls his car away. Ian Sr. has watched this and, like a schoolboy, finds this highly amusing, <laughs> highly amusing that he has had to help Hume out. So just before Hume departs, he leans into the window and he says, There you are, young Hume. That's real power. <laughs> And Hume, quick as a flash, says, no, Ian, that's power sharing. <laughs> it's great. It's a great story. So I thought, being the cynical old journalist, that's apocryphal. That's not true. So I contacted Don McRae, who was the driver, and I told him my version that I'd just given you with my bad Paisley impression. And he said, 100% true. And I contacted Ian Paisley Jr. and he said exactly the same thing. So yeah. the story is true. It's a great which is story. Great, which is great. Fabulous story. We'll take another question. There's a, two hands there. Yeah, take the, I'll take the one at the back and then, and then I'll come up into the middle. Thanks a million. It's a great story. I'd like to know if this uh, 
is there any comparison? What lessons could be taught to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Is oh, there gosh. any comparison? Um, we just need a John Hume and a David Trimble, <laughs> maybe. Well, I, I mean, I, there are obvious comparisons. Uh, yeah. the, the issue of identity, writ large in Northern Ireland and has been writ large for, for 40, 50 years. I think ultimately there has to be discussions. There will be no, uh, no long-term political solution without discussions. I, I, you know, I'm, I, I'm in no way an expert on the Middle East and I will not start to pontificate on the Middle East. I have enough difficulty with Northern Ireland, thank you very much, but <laughs> I, I, at, a, at a basic level, it has to be discussions and it has to be some kind of mediator. Northern Ireland, the Good Friday Agreement came about um, because there was uh, faith and confidence with those parties that signed it. Mm. There was also outside influence. Without the influence of George Mitchell, you would have not had a Good Friday Agreement. And I would suspect that the conflict in the Middle East needs outside influence. It needs outside influence that both parties are comfortable with. It needs discussions. Uh, but without that outside influence, I cannot imagine how that problem is going to be solved. Really good answer, Stephen. Um, there's, yep, question there in the middle, and then I'll come to the other side. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, you document the dissension in the SDLP in the late 80s and early 90s in some detail in the book. Um, in your view, was it absolutely inevitable for Hume to sideline his colleagues in order to deliver Hume Adams and ultimately to deliver the ceasefire in 94? Oh, good question. Uh, yes, because I think he was, he was committed that uh, the only way there was going to be an end to violence was if Republicans were part of the solution. The only way there was going to be a political accommodation was if Republicans were part of that solution. And I think that was his mantra. That was his mantra to party colleagues during party meetings. And that was also his mantra uh, to political opponents. Uh, John Alderdice uh, tells a, an interesting anecdote of when he was in a meeting with Jim Molyneux and Paisley and Hume. And Hume basically turned to Molyneux and Paisley and said, it's all very well us talking here, but we have to talk to Sinn Féin. And Alderdice talks about how the color drained from Molyneux's face about the prospect of there being somebody from Sinn Féin in the room. Um, so Hume realized that everybody involved in, in the Northern Ireland, inverted commas, problem had to be involved in the Northern Ireland, inverted commas, solution. And I think he basically privately issued ultimatums to his party colleagues and said, look, this is the way I think we need to go forward. You either back me or, or, you, or you sack me. And I think, um, also I think there was a bit of jealousy there as well. I think it, was, it wasn't just a straightforward political criticism. I think people were slightly jealous of John because he was going around the world, he was feted, he was well known in America, he was well known in Brussels, and all political parties have characters with egos, have characters with their own agendas, and I think the SDLP was no different from other political parties. Really interesting, Stephen. Another question for Stephen? Yep, one there. Thanks both for a very interesting discussion. Um, and interestingly, obviously, Stephen uh, identified the Good Friday Agreement as John Hume's um, excuse me, uh, crowning achievement. And we've just passed the 25th anniversary. And the, the view has very much been it's delivered peace, but it hasn't delivered good or stable government for Northern Ireland in many respects. <clears throat> Do you think if, if John Hume was around today, he would, he would be arguing that um, the Good Friday Agreement should be reformed to that it, you know, there, were, there are flaws in its design that need to be changed, or would he be of a view that it is still a, a sort of fundamentally good product and that what it requires is more politicians who are willing to look beyond narrow party interests to kind of work the agreement? Good question. That's another easy question. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I think he was, I, 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 think he would, I think he would argue caution. I think he would argue that if you are going to tinker or revise or change, then you have to revise with care um, because he would argue that the fundamentals of the Good Friday Agreement 
have to remain in place. There has to be that north-south element. There has to be that east-west element. There has to be the element of cooperative coalition government. So I think um, he would be urging caution. I think fundamentally, if he was alive today and he had witnessed the absence of government in Northern Ireland, I think fundamentally he would be incredibly saddened. I think he would be saddened by the fact that a lot of the heavy lifting was done. Actually, getting people to the table was heavy. Getting people to agree on, on policing, the release of prisoners, decommissioning. I mean, these are big issues. Mm. And, and he would be disappointed and angry that, that government is being held up because of, I suppose, ultimately, Brexit um, and, the, and the outpourings of, of, of Brexit. And he would be deeply saddened by that. On a personal level, um, one, of the, one of the sad things about John Hume, at the end, because of his dementia, he actually couldn't remember the Good Friday Agreement. And he couldn't remember that he was an essential part of it. And he couldn't remember what he had delivered. Mm -hmm. And on a personal level, I think that's deeply sad. Yeah. Tragic. I have one more question, and then I'll rap, as they say, because I'm getting rap signs from the back. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I knew John Hume uh, over a good no number of years, um, and I had a similar educational background to John, so we, we kind of understood each other on that level. Um, but one of my first real contacts with John was uh, back in 1973, when he came to New York as the Minister for Commerce mm -hmm. in the Sunningdale executive of that time, the short-lived Sunningdale executive. And that was a role he took to with great enthusiasm. And the, the trip to America was, was, was a very important part of that. He, he saw that as the opening up of uh, Northern Ireland to uh, external economic support. Um, and he thought that that could work. Of course, he was sorely disappointed in this. And I think that um, people sometimes concentrate too much on the Hume, Trem uh, Hume Trimble axis to have got the, the Good Friday Agreement over the line, but it started with Hume Adams. Mm. And that was, to me, that was, uh, that was part of John's learning process put into effect because he knew that you had to have that basis with the extremes in order to make the thing work at the center. Mm. So uh, I don't know if you agree with that. I haven't, I don't know if you deal with the Sunningdale part much in your book, I haven't read it yet, but it seems that John learned an awful lot from that experience which he put into effect when he was working on the design of the Good Friday Agreement. Thank you. Really interesting, yeah. Um, I, do deal, I do deal with Sunningdale and he um, enjoyed, you're absolutely right, he enjoyed being Minister for Commerce. He enjoyed the fact that, that he thought this was a role where he could help people because he, he believed that, you know, by setting up industries, by setting up uh, firms, that you're giving people um, uh, a sense of worth because he knew uh, how awful unemployment had been because he'd, he'd seen his father being unemployed. So he knew the importance uh, of, of economic regeneration. So he liked the idea of being Minister for Commerce. That appealed to him. Uh, he was bitterly disappointed with the fall of Stormont. Um, that's, that, that scarred him. Uh, I think it moved him in a direction that there could not be an internal solution in Northern Ireland simply with the parties on their own. And I think the collapse of Stormont galvanized him so that he continued those uh, outreaches that you were talking about to America. He realized that if Northern Ireland was to be solved or sorted, then it needed help from Dublin, it needed help from London, it needed help from the United States, and it needed help um, uh, from Europe. Uh, and he loved also being a, an MEP. In terms of your point uh, with uh, Hume and Trimble, you are absolutely right. Without Hume Adams, there would be no Good Friday Agreement. Mm. Uh, without the peace process, and, and you know, George Mitchell famously said, you know, without Hume, there was no peace process. Without Trimble, there was no Good Friday Agreement. But in terms of the timeline, mm. um, Hume very often was a lone voice in arguing that, we have to, that they have to continue that dialogue with Gerry Adams. So that is an essential part of the book, yes. 
Thanks so much for that contribution. Anyway, it's a wonderful book. Everyone should buy it. Stephen, You're I love kind. chatting to you. <laughs> Thank you so much today. Ladies and gentlemen, Stephen Walker. Good job. Are you happy? Yes. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.